Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Seed World Strategy webinar. My name is Alex Martin, and I serve as the editor for Seed World. And today, I'm happy to be your host. Today's theme is breeding a more nutritional popcorn, and it is just really going to knock your socks off. Uh, we're going to be live tweeting during today's webinar. So if you'd like to join our conversation, please use the hashtag strategy webinar to connect with us. Uh, we'd also like to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available at seedworld.com following the proceedings. Presenting our webinar today are two fantastic speakers. We have Jay Hulbert of Ag Alumni Seed and David Holding of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, now, during the presentation, you're probably going to, going to have some questions for our speakers. Um, please type these into the chat box at any time during the webinar, and we're going to address them during the Q&A session we'll hold after the speakers finish their presentations at the end. Um, in today's webinar, you're going to learn a little bit about the history and background of the popcorn seed industry, but we're also going to be able to hear a little bit about consumers' thoughts on our favorite salty snack. We're also going to learn why popcorn has taken a turn to consider nutrition, and specifically, we're going to learn a little bit about quality protein popcorn, or QPP, as we'll, we'll call it during this webinar. Um, now, our first speaker of, of the day is uh, Jay Holbert. James J. Holbert is the president and chief executive officer of Ag Alumni Seed, which is one of the world's leading breeder, producer, and marketer of hybrid, hybrid popcorn seed. He is a seasoned executive leader who has been active in agribusiness organizations for more than three decades. And Jay has started his career at his family farm, uh, Holbert Farms Incorporated, and since has served in national and international productions, uh, M&A, strategic planning, sales and marketing, and senior leadership roles for companies such as uh, Simonis um, and International Garden Products, among others. So, uh, hi, everybody. Um, let me just talk for, uh, for a little bit about uh, the commercial uh, history of popcorn breeding. Um, I'm with Ag Alumni Seed. We are a not-for-profit affiliate of Purdue University, um, originally Indiana's foundation seed company, and long story, but we are now a specialist in the uh, breeding, marketing, and production of hybrid popcorn seed. Uh, we work in about 40 different countries, and as part of our not-for-profit mission, we support the Purdue College of Agriculture contributing some $3.8 million over the past five years. Um, talking about popcorn, popcorn, uh, as is true of all corn, uh, was originally bred by Native Americans thousands of years ago. The oldest years of popcorn uh, were discovered in the Bat Cave in New Mexico and, and dated to about 4,000 years uh, BCE. Um, French settlers in North America around 1612 noticed uh, popped popcorn um, and uh, uh, began to partake. Um, European immigrants embraced the Native American corn culture and ate corn in many forms, including popcorn. It was, it was sort of a home thing, and then consumption on a commercial level started to take off in the 1890s. Uh, with events like the uh, the World Fairs, the during the Great Depression, popcorn provided a cheap snack and became forever linked to uh, movie theaters. Uh, uh, something that's important to the current day. Um, with the invention of microwave popcorn and more recently uh, the uh, rapid growth of ready-to-eat popcorn, consumption took off even more. A lot of different formats and a lot of different brands. Uh, popcorn is a global snack. Uh, the US is a very important popcorn country, but it's widely consumed in South America. Uh, it's really consumed at this point all over the world. Um, on the left there is a picture of a street vendor in Serbia, and on the right, a uh, combine harvesting popcorn in Brazil. Popcorn is fundamentally a healthy snack. Um, David is going to talk about making it uh, 
more nutritious, but it's a, it's a whole grain snack and it pushes all the right buttons for a positive nutrition message. And on the right is uh, uh, the back label of Amplify Brands uh, Skinny Pop, uh, zero trans fat, no artificial flavors, preservative-free, tree nut-free, peanut-free, dairy-free, gluten-free. And um, an important factor is, is non-GMO. Um, as a seed company, as a popcorn breeder, we would love to be able to solve farmer problems with GMOs. Uh, BT, <clears throat> excuse me, BT popcorn would be a particular advantage. However, uh, because popcorn is consumed and produced globally, uh, uh, Europe is a very important popcorn market, and they have essentially zero tolerance <clears throat> for GMOs and foods that are consumed directly by humans. So for that reason, the major popcorn companies decided some 25 years ago to stay GMO free, and, and that's where we are today. Uh, key attributes in breeding popcorn yield, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, is absolutely critical. And just like any other type of corn, uh, the components of yield, including disease resistance, lodging resistance, tolerance to moisture stress, and, and so forth, are, are very important. The second uh, key attribute of popcorn is expansion, and that is measured in the cc's of popcorn the volume you get from a gram uh the the mass of an amount of grain and simply put because movie theaters are a very important market if you, if you're if you own a movie theater you know exactly how many 50 pound bags of grain you buy and how many gallons or liters of popcorn you sell and so that's a that's a key ratio um Flake type is very important. On the left is uh, butterfly popcorn. On the right, mushroom popcorn. Uh, butterfly is by far the uh, predominant type. Uh, mushroom popcorn is used for heavy candy coatings, caramel coatings, and that sort of thing. Uh, other attributes include uh, grain color and shape. Uh, in a lot of markets, a round grain is uh, desirable. Uh, with a dark orange color, uh, especially in the developing world where people are buying popcorn in a in a plastic or glycine bag, and they can they can look at it and and see the grain. White popcorn is a niche product, uh, particularly in in sort of the upper Midwest of the United States. Uh, and there are also there are colored popcorns. There there's black popcorn and red popcorn and so forth. And the color is all in the uh, uh, in the aliron layer, uh, not in the not in the endosperm, so you you lose uh, most of that color when you pop it. Uh, flavor and mouthfeel are absolutely critical. Um, it is a product that's consumed uh, consumed directly and consumed by all kinds of people. So you we it, it's a challenge to breed for that. Steph Curry likes popcorn. Vladimir Putin likes popcorn. Kids like popcorn. Everybody likes popcorn. Um, but not everybody likes it the same way. So uh, this is an example. Uh, on the left there is a microwave popcorn uh, that was uh, promoted in Brazil a few years ago. Um, it turned out to be very popular. and It's mustard-flavored popcorn. That, that sounds very odd, uh, particularly to an American. But uh, you, you know what? On a hot day with a cold beer, it's pretty good. Uh, in Mexico with escabeche, with uh, um, uh, pickled vegetables, or just with chili powder and lime juice, uh, uh, very popular way to eat popcorn there. Um, go back to yield and expansion a little bit. Uh, as you run into all the time in plant breeding, uh, yield and expansion are linked and opposed. Um, and without getting into the into the detailed genetics, let's just simply say that uh, it's very difficult to have both high yield and high expansion. So hybrids tend to be grouped in high yielding but lower expansion. 
high expansion but lower yielding or balance types with uh, with mid levels of expansion and yield. Um, in in plant breeding, we use a lot of the same tools that uh, any corn breeder would. Our, our plot harvesters, of course, are a key tool for evaluation of yield. Um, in the center there, we have a uh, uh, what we call our mushroom machine. It uses um, uh, machine learning and uh, a visual evaluation to give us a very fast read of the uh, in a sample of popped corn, the percentage of mushroom and the percentage of butterfly. And then on the right is uh, the metric weight uh, volume tester. Uh, that's a standard machine used in the industry made by Creators in Chicago. Uh, and it pops a uh, measured volume or measured uh, weight of popcorn, 250 grams. And that goes into a graduated cylinder uh, that allows us to measure the expansion. Uh, hybrid seed production, what we do there is the same as every other corn seed company. Um, we uh, uh, detassel, we harvest on the ear, um, clean, treat, and uh, package, and then, and then ship seed all over the world. And with that, I will wrap it up and pass it back to Alex. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, so our second speaker of the day today is um, David Holding, who is an associate professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, David earned a bachelor's degree in biochemistry at the University of Sussex and a PhD in plant molecular genetics from King's College London. During postdocs at UC Riverside and University of Arizona, he worked on molecular genetic, uh, molecular genetic aspects of plant development, including root development uh, and endosperm development and maize. Uh, he came to the University of Nebraska in 2009, where he has focused on functional genomics uh, studies of endosperm development in cereals and applied methods for improving kernel quality. He uses different methods for understanding the, the molecular genetic basis of kernel development in quality protein maize, or QPM, and incorporating this knowledge into accelerated QPM breeding projects, including things such as quality protein popcorn. Uh, to understand more general uh, factors essential for endosperm filling and mature uh, maturation, David has developed large-scale mutagenesis mapping and gene identification platforms for maize. Uh, applying the basic scientific knowledge which his and other groups have generated, he is using a gene editing approach to improve kernel protein quality and digestibility in sorghum and maize, which will lead to pr uh, products free of the regulatory constraints which normally constrict biotechnology enhanced crops. So um, thank you so much for joining us today, David, and we'll go ahead and let you take it away from here. Well, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jay, for the, the fascinating introduction to popcorn. So I should um, I should just preface what I'm going to talk about by saying when Conagra came to um, University of Nebraska uh, in in about 2012 to begin to they basically moved their entire breeding uh, program temporarily to UNL. Um, we we were one of the first questions we asked was was a genetically was a GMO approach possible. Uh, Jay, could you mute your microphone? Um, and we would quickly, as, as Jay said, the um, popcorn breeders made the decision about 25 years ago that this that GMO was not on the table for popcorn. And so um, what I'm going to tell you about is a project that involved, that is a traditional breeding approach um, with a natural mutation called opaque 2, uh, which confers high lysine quality. Um, so just just to um, um, Alex already went over. I do a number of things in my lab, both basic and applied. Um, we have. I'm very interested in functional genomics in terms of uh, identifying basically genes controlling kernel development in maize and sorghum. And my group has devised several different mapping approaches that that use high throughput sequencing um, and bulk segment mapping. And so we've 
got lots of mutations in maize and different ways to map those those mutations and identify candidate genes. So I'm not going to talk about that, obviously. Um, Alex also alluded to this sorghum project where we're using CRISPR. It's a similar project to the popcorn project, but um, sorghum has the added disadvantage that the proteins are highly indigestible. So we're using a CRISPR approach to increase slicing and improve the digestibility. But what I've focused on a lot over the last, well, more than 10 years is quality protein maize. And I've been at the forefront of identifying the so-called modifier genes, what convert a, a, a soft opaque kernel to a modified useful QPM kernel. And then in the last seven or eight years, um, we've been to, we've been using the knowledge that we've generated in, in QPM and brought that into, into popcorn. To, and, and what I'm going to tell you about is that the fairly late stages of the project where, whereby we've in, increased the lysine substantially in fully um, poppable and high yielding popcorn. Okay. Um, so before I, before I get into popcorn, I just want to give you a very brief background about what opaque two is. Um, and now for the next couple of slides, I'm talking about dent corn or field corn. Um, so opaque two, the prolamins, uh, zein proteins, and what is what is QPM as opposed to QPP, quality protein maize, as opposed to quality protein popcorn. It's a similar thing, just in two different subspecies of maize. So in the in the kernels of of maize, of all maize species, you have these prolamins shown in this, in this protein gel on the top left, uh, which really dominate the kernel proteins, these CN proteins. Um, and these CN proteins are organized into uh, protein bodies that, that accumulate in the endoplasmic reticulum of cells in, in these layered structures called CN protein bodies. Now, it's these high-level accumulation of CNs that give, that give maize its typically hard kernel or glassy or vitreous uh, um, kernel appearance, which, which is good. Uh, unfortunately, CN proteins are, are actually devoid, not just deficient, they're devoid of several essential amino acids, including, including lysine and tryptophan. These are essential in the diets of, of humans and monogastric livestock. So although corn has a high amount, relatively high amount of protein, that is not a complete protein. And so you cannot, so animals and humans cannot obviously survive on, on a diet of, of uh, of cereals alone just because of this deficiency in in the prolamin proteins. So opaque 2 is a mutant of maize and you can see this picture of the, the kernels look very different. Opaque 2 has these chalky um, white kernels which actually increase which, which actually make the kernels softer. So that's a disadvantage which ultimately uh, prevented opaque 2 maize being used on a large scale for, for livestock feed because it has uh, a yield penalty and the kernels are a little bit more difficult to harvest and store, etc. On the plus side, opaque 2 maize has double the level of, of two, two essential amino acids shown in this table. And the reason for that doubling of essential amino acids, if you look and now look at the, the protein gels in the bottom right of the slide, um, you can see opaque 2 has a low level of CN proteins. And through a process that we call proteome rebalancing, because the because it makes less of the proteins that it wants to, these CNs, it makes more of non-CN proteins. Collectively, the non-CNs have a better balance of, of essential amino acids, and that explains the increase in lysine and tryptophan. As I said, opaque 2 was not ultimately useful on a large scale commercially. Um, after that happened, uh, breeders got hold of opaque two, and they they started selecting for for vitreous kernel varieties of opaque two. You can see in this photo the QPM kernel has a very highly vitreous kernel, even though it's still an opaque two mutant. And the reason for that is because modify un, at that point unknown modifier genes were selected for. And a lot of my research has been trying to define what these modifier genes are that allow modification of soft opaque two to hard opaque two. Okay. Um, so what do we know about QPM? So we know that if you, so now looking at the, uh, the protein gels in the 
bottom left, we know that QPM has low levels of these alpha CM proteins, just like opaque 2. But if you look at the, the dark, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer here, so you, I'm just going to have to describe what I'm, what I'm looking at. If you look at the QPM in the CN gel, if you look at the QPM um, protein profile, you see that there's an intense dark band. Now, that's called the 27 kilodalton gamma CN, and it turns out that that's the main difference between opaque 2 kernels and modified opaque 2 kernels. And actually, that um, that gamma Z and gene is, the, is behind the largest QTL for endosperm modification. And we now know that that, 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 that higher level of that gamma Z and protein results from a gene duplication of, of gamma Z and itself. If you look at, now look at the non Z and gel, you see that just like opaque 2, QPM has this elevated level of non Z and proteins. And that, that is the basis of the high lysine um, phenotype in 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 QPM. So that was QPM dent corn. Now, why would we want to make a QPM version of popcorn? Well, as we know, we we don't um, popcorn is not used for livestock feed. So uh, an, an enhanced protein quality popcorn wouldn't probably wouldn't be useful as a feed. Um, and we don't generally consume popcorn as a as a staple protein uh, source. But um, but. We undertook this with the with the thinking that a, a quality protein popcorn containing all the essential amino acids would create a unique snack food um, that would be relevant in a, in the healthy food market. And as I said, this is a non GM product, and so it's fully compatible with organic and small um, small scale production, ready to eat mark marketing, and as a snack, it's easily distributed distributed and, and prepared. Another thing that we were cognizant of when we started this is that we're changing, we're completely changing the proteome of, of this product. And so, um, and we're changing the levels of protein bound and free amino acids. And so the part of the flavor and aroma development in popcorn comes from the formation of these com complex compounds called pyrazines. And lysine is a very critical amino acid in pyrazine formation. So we thought it would highly possible that we would actually create different flavor and aroma profile uh, uh, in the products that we were making. And, and lastly, um, so people who've tried to, to mine traits from dent corn into popcorn have largely been very unsuccessful because you can, you can transfer traits across agronomic traits, but generally it's very difficult to recover, to recover popping ability. And of course, popcorn that doesn't pop is useless. So what I'm going to describe is two uh, is two phases of this project. One one is a proof of concept in the, in which we made inbred quality protein popcorn lines, and that was published uh, two years ago in 2018. And we've just published the first of two papers on on the hybrid production of these of these Q QPP lines. Okay, so QPP fits into, if you, if you uh, look at the graph on the left, this is basically representing uh, the increase in demands for healthy foods, and that can be broken down into these different subcategories. The text is a little small here, but food, food um, organic food, better for you, uh, functional foods, naturally healthy. We can, we can justify that QPP fits into all of, all of these different categories. And the graph on the right represents the increase in, in sales of ready to eat popcorn. So this is where we're really uh, anticipating that there will be a market for this elevated protein quality. Again, I'd, I want to emphasize that we're not increasing the total amount of protein here. We're increasing, we're changing the the relative proportion of different types of protein to create a better amino, amino acid balance in this product. So the strategy you, we used was crossing between multiple um, publicly available UPMs and multiple elite ConAgra popcorns. Okay, so these are proprietary lines. And so for that reason, I'm not showing you the line numbers of any of these. I just simply refer to these popcorns as a, as a number. Okay, we used marker-assisted breeding in the early stages to select for the opaque 2 gene and mutation and rapid introgression into the popcorn background. Um, we used physical selection of this, of this gamma Z in protein by, by doing lots of protein gels and uh, 
for for the actual amino acid content measurements this was this we, we did these at the at pretty much at the end of the two phases because this is an expensive part and we knew uh, we knew which lines were going to have um, elevated lysine simply from the from their protein profiles and then if you look at one thing that one reason why I really thought that this project had a high chance of success if you look at the the um, sections of the different types of dent corn these three wild type opaque two and QPM corn next to popcorn one thing that jumped jumped out at me right away is that QPM and popcorn have a very similar a very similar in that they both have this very high proportion of vitreous or glassy endosperm. That glassiness really is a result of the specific proportion of protein and protein bodies and starch grains that give rise to this the, the type of starch matrix that will will melt and pop under under heat. Opaque kernels, opaque popcorn does not pop. So it was very important that we recovered this glassy phenotype in in our QPP. Okay, so at the start we did that we basically mined all of the different quality protein mazes we could get our hands on from the stock center to cut it and, and, and tested the agronomics and the and the protein quality and lots of different parameters of these lines. We actually made F1 crosses in the early days between all of these 12 QPMs to um, all of the different uh, con agra popcorns that are available to make a long story short we ended up with just three qpms um, and the inbreds that i'm going to describe were a result of these three qpms and also i'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the breeding scheme but again we started in in the winter in the greenhouse of uh, of uh, 2012 we did the uh, because of dense sterility jade didn't mention this, but uh, popcorn has dense sterility, which means it cannot it cannot successfully receive popcorn uh, pollen from surrounding dent corn. Um, and that, if it could, that would be a problem because it would mean that popcorn had to be very, very isolated from from GMO corn. And because popcorn cannot be pollinated by um, conventional dent corn. Um, we had to do the crosses using popcorn as the male to the QPM. Okay, and it's very important that that dense sterility is maintained as we go through the breeding process. So to, to make a very long story short, um, we arrived at um, BC2, and we now have BC3 to the F4 generation. And what I'm going to show you is is uh, the the characteristics of those BC2 um, F5s. Um, so, so we use it. We use genetic selection for opaque two, biochemical selection for gamma zein, as I said, and physical selection for this vitreous popcorn phenotype. Um, and what I'm showing here, we we obtained multiple different BC2 F5s from lots of different introgressions, um, and we were able to show that these had a hundred. These were a hundred percent opaque two with uniform modification, that's uniform vitreousness and increased non -seans. And if you look at the, the gels here, the second gel in is just the, the, the zein profile of, the, the second lane in is the zein profile of conventional popcorn, which has this high level of alpha zeans, low level of the gamma zein, but then all of our QPP inbreds had low alpha zeans and high gamma zein. So they're definitely opaque too, and they're definitely modified because they have this high level gamma zein. Then if you look at the gel below that, you see that the, without exception, all of the different QPP inbreds have a higher level of non zein proteins than the second lane in, which is our popcorn parent. Um, so this, we already knew from this, this, this type of result that these were all going to be high lysine. And those amino acid tests are relatively time consuming and expensive. So as I said, we don't do amino acid tests until we're pretty sure that we have the line lines we want to go forward with. So this is this is just showing you the difference in kernel morphology between our QPM parents. So the top three, they have much larger kernels. They're more angular because the kernels pack into those ears. And if you look at popcorn, as Jay said, round kernels are desirable and and there's not there's an inverse relationship between often an inverse relationship between kernel size and kernel 
uh, expansion volume. And what you'll see is that um, our QPP inbreds, QP1 through 6 shown here, have that um, round popcorn phenotype. They're a little bit larger um, on, than the than the uh, popcorn parents. And you can see that they, they do have a very high proportion of this vitreous endosperm, although um, some of them have a slightly larger central, that white um, region in the, in the middle. And, and as you can see, that had a slight, that sometimes has a slight negative effect on, on the popping volume. But these are definitely popcorn and they're definitely um, modified opaque too. So then we did uh, amino acid profiling. And what we do here is, is we measure the free lysine content and the protein bound lysine content. And right away, you can see that there's a much more extreme increase in the free lysine con content, quite variable, but ranging between five and, and um, 20 times the level of free lysine in our QPP inbreds. So uh, similar to the, to the QPM parents shown in the left three um, lanes on this, on this graph. Now looking at the graph on the right-hand side, this is our protein bound lysine. And what you can see is, is at ranging between a 50 and a 100% increase in the level of protein bound lysine. Now, this is what we're really interested in because the scale, if you look at the scales on these graphs, most lysine is bound up in protein. So although the, the, pro, the lysine increase in the protein bound is not as pronounced as in the free lysine, it actually accounts for more of the lysine increase simply because lysine is much more of the lysine is tied up in, in this bound form. Um, so we know we've got high lysine popcorn, um, but obviously we need to know uh, how does it perform in a, in a popping context. What I'm showing here is that, yes, it's all popcorn. We had very, very high popability in terms of percentage. And what we found was that some, in, some inbreds are insignificantly different in their popping volume from, from their particular popcorn. Um, popcorn parent, and sometimes we see a slight reduction in popping volume. So there's still um, so there's still some work to do in terms of selection for popping volume, um, but it's not clear whether we need to because this is going to be a niche product anyway with different attributes. It's not clear that we need to be to match the uh, uh, popcorn parents. Um, a hundred percent in terms of the pop volume, but also we have a lot of scope for for increasing that more in our hybrids. So what I've talked about up until now is purely um, our inbred uh, QPPs. So this is basically proof of concept that we can completely rebalance the proteome, have a different, completely different array of zeans and a completely different array of non zeans and still get fully poppable uh, popcorn with low zeans, high lysine. Um, and so these inbreds are agro, but the thing is these are inbreds, okay? So they're agronomically suboptimal. Just like the, the ConAgra inbred parents, those are not the varieties that, that ConAgra would mark, would actually uh, pro produce for sale. Um, those, are the, those are the varieties that they would cross together in specific combinations to take advantage of heterosis and hybrid vigor. So we were cognizant that we needed to do, make multiple integrations of, the, of these QPP lines from the beginning. Because if we just ended up with one, we would have no scope for hybrid production because all of our inbreds in partners in hybrids both need to contain the homozygous mutant opaque to allele in order for that to maintain that hybrid trait. So this is just a, this is just demonstrating that we ended up with uh, about six different inbreds, um, and this and so if we cross these inbreds together in all in all combinations, we have we have fifteen different hybrids possible, and these hybrids uh, would have. Um, the same QPM or di different popcorn parent or same popcorn and different QPM parents or different popcorn and QPM parents. So we were really interested to see what these different crossing combinations resulted in in terms of hybrid vigor. So uh, to, to again, to make a long story short, this is a similar 
a similar slide to what I showed with the inbreds, but in the F2 kernel, so we made F1 crosses in the, in the summer of um, 2018. And last summer, Leandra and I, the graduate student, Le uh, Leandra, the graduate student who's done most of the work on, on these hybrids, we grew out the F1 plants and harvested the F2 ears. And so the, the uh, F2 kernels, you can see have uh, the, this classic uh, low Zian, low alpha Zian, high gamma Zian profile and variable in, uh, variably increased non Zian. So, uh, so we knew that the, that the high lysine trait was maintained in these, in these different hybrids. Okay, so this is just a, um, the, we were very pleased with the, with the popping of these hybrids. And what I'm showing in these panels here is that we've got a diversity of different flake types. Jay mentioned that this butterfly popcorn, which is the variety that's sold in movie theaters, and then you have mushroom popcorn, which is more robust and, and amenable to coating with caramel and uh, other, uh, other coatings tend to cause damage to, to the kernel. So what I'm showing in these different six panels is in the, in the center row, in the center column is the is the kernels that were, is the hybrid kernels and the two surrounding columns are the are the the inbred parents that gave rise to that hybrid and what you can see is that the center column often has larger so the hybrids often have larger expansion volume than either of the parents and also they don't always follow the same um, flake characteristics as the as the two inbred parents, so that's interesting. And 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 I mentioned the um, aroma characteristics. So we were testing these. Um, we've tasted these, obviously, and the, you'll have to believe me when I say that there's uh, a real diversity of different tastes in these. And some of them are really quite interesting in their in their flavors, even without any salt or oil or toppings like that. So we're, um, we're quite pleased with that. So obviously in the, f um, we were, we had a, a number of, we had a lot of different hybrids that we really wanted to narrow down before we did the final scale yield trials, which we're doing this summer. So we had about 50 different hybrids that we, that we characterized in the field last year. And they perform well agronomically. Um, there's some, actually a mistake in this slide. Uh, hybrids perform well agronomically um, and qualitatively against elite popcorn hybrids. What I'm showing in these boxes is the QPP hybrid and the and its and its associated inbred compared to the popcorn inbred parent. Okay, this is not hybrid. Okay, so this is obviously before we finally decide which lines are, should be marketed, we need to compare our hybrids to the equivalent hybrids. Um, in the field, and that's what we're doing through open pollinated field trials. But um, that being said, these these lines perform well agronomically in terms of various different agronomic traits. The popping volume is seen as a little bit reduced sometimes compared to, to the popcorn parent. Um, but importantly, we see a very high uh, percentage of popping. So it would be a problem if if only fifty percent of kernels were popping, for example. So this should be percentage, not out of one. And we can see that um, there's a, almost 100% of, of uh, kernels popping in our, in our hybrid varieties. So that's good. And um, how, do we, how do we prioritize these, given that, we're, that we tested in a number of different agronomic parameters and qualitative parameters, how are we going to prioritize uh, the, the, from these 50 different hybrids, which ones we really are going to recommend to Conagra um, to, that, we, that need to be commercialized. So Leandra, the graduate student, came up with an elegant um, selection index that incorporated all of, all of the traits I showed you on the last slide and others, um, and basically assigned a weighting to each of those traits. This, this was not including uh, amino acid quality, because at that stage we had we we, we weren't going to do amino acid profiling on 50 different hybrids, um, but we but since we knew they were all opaque too, we knew they would all have high equivalent high lysine. So we saved the amino acid profiling to till we whittled these down to a much smaller number. And so basically, what these different 
weighted bars show is that the smallest bar um, over on the left hand side of the grain of, of the graph represent the lines that we that we're proud that have the best uh, combination of all of these traits. So I won't go into how we actually weighted the different traits, but um, just we did. Okay. Um, so what was what was the lysine like of these of these? So we selected these down to about ten different lines based on those priorities, uh, those parameters, and we can see that the that the protein bound lysine is approaching the the uh, level of the original QPM parent shown by the dark green bar. Uh, bars on the on the right hand side of the top graph, and then the bottom graph is just showing the protein bound lysine, comparing the male and female parents with the hybrid, which being the green bar in the middle. So oftentimes we see that the that the middle bar, the hybrid, is is in between the two parents, which is usually what you see for any trait in uh, in 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 terms of heterosis. Now you might be wondering, um, ever up until this stage, all of the amino acid profiling we'd done was on flour that came from um, raw kernels, raw popcorn kernels that had been ground up and then used to to establish the different amino acids. Now obviously we don't eat popcorn as raw as whole kernels or even flour. What's relevant to know is how does the lysine shape up when we actually pop these kernels. So this study shows that we we compared um, the raw kernel flour to different popping me mechanisms, including air popping, microwave popping, and oil popping. And you can see that um, the different popping mechanisms do have an effect on the lysine content, and they do reduce the lysine content. Okay, so that obviously air popping, which is probably the way that, the, it's, that this is going to go for this for the, this ready to eat varieties has the least detrimental effect on the lysine content but it but that so the the line the pink lines at the bottom are showing uh, the the popcorn parents so you can see that they have light much less lysine under all circumstances and our if you look at our, our different Q, um, QPP hybrids and inbreds they're all higher than the unpopped kernels of of the conventional popcorn parents. So although we see, even with air popping, we see a slight reduction in the lysine content, we're confident that it still, uh, it still uh, represents a substantial increase in the available lysine content to, at, the, at the consumer level. So as I said, currently we're conducting large scale field trials, open pollinated field trials, using the five best hybrids. Um, and from that, we will be able to, to recommend to, to Conagra um, which, which ones uh, are going to be commercialized. Okay, that's all I have to say about this, this project. So Ying Ren was a graduate student who did most of the work on the, uh, up, up until the, high, the, on the inbred popcorns. And then Leandra took over about three years ago. Uh, on the hybrid production, and they've just both done an amazing job on, on this project. Oscar Rodriguez is the popcorn breeder at Conagra, who worked for a, a few years at UNL when, when Conagra brought their breeding project program to, to UNL. And Ruthie Angelivi, she is my collaborator for amino acid profiling. So thank you very much for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much, David and Jay. So we have enough time now that I'd like to do a short Q&A session. So if you have a question for Jay or David that you haven't already asked, please make sure to go ahead and type it into the chat box now. Um, so Jay, our first question actually came for you um, about the colored popcorn you mentioned. And this person wanted to know, um, are there any mutants for colored popcorn? And if yes, then what is the commercial importance in yield and other traits? So there are a variety of colors in popcorn, pretty much all the colors that you would see in, in uh, what's commonly referred to as Indian corn. Um, the two that you see most often in the market are black and red, uh, a deep red color. Uh, there's also a light color, a mauve color. Um, 
all those uh, those colors are all uh, uh, essentially on the on the uh, alurone, right? uh, uh, on the effectively on the surface of the kernel, um, and not into the endosperm. So uh, there's a very small effect of color on the on the popped corn. Um, taken together, the different color popcorns probably make up less than one half of one percent of the market. So it's it's very definitely a niche within a niche. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jay. That's a sure. great answer to a question. Um, another question for you, Jay, before we, we get into some other questions that are a little bit more for David. Um, can you talk about the, the retention of nutrients from grain to popcorn? Um, I think this would be a little bit more up your alley, but David, if you have um, anything that you'd like to chime in, feel free to, to jump in as well. There, there has been some work done on, on uh, uh, carotenoid uh, retention. Um, carotenoids mm -hmm. are degraded by light and heat, uh, and the popping process is pretty harsh on, in, in terms of, uh, of those, those uh, compounds. Perfect. How do anthocyanins <laughs> hold up with, with popping, Jay? You know, I don't know, David. I, mm. I don't. Because uh, um, that would be, although the color is not in the endosperm, so you, as you said, you lose a lot of the color when you pop. That might be a, a, a feather in its cap if the if the anthocyanins were maintained during popping nutritionally. It might be as long as long as they're not blown off with the pericarp. Um, right, and, and I haven't seen data on on anthocyanin, so I'm you know just speculating. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, thank you so much, both of you. Um, and then, uh, David, this next question is actually for you, and it asks, um, can we use this? These uh, QPM genes for its application. Uh, sorry, can we use these QPM genes? For application in other cereals to enhance amino acids, potentially through, um, I think they said, uh, gene editing tools. Uh, um, well, so as I alluded to, we have a, a, a gene editing project that that reduces the prolamins in in uh, sorghum. Um, this is not doing this through. This is uh, not directly related to the opaque two modifiers. This is basically shutting down the the cafferin proteins in sorghum. Um, so this could be done. You could do this. Uh, you could make a quality protein maize version of maize, or or even popcorn using CRISPR. You could shut down the the CN proteins, and then you, perhaps potentially you would have uh, less of the negative consequences that you get from the opaque two mutation. But um, the problem with that is that, it, that it's, it's genetically modified and CRISPR in this country is, is regulated not as a, as, a GM, as a GMO, but in European countries, uh, it, is still, it is very definitely regulated as a, as a, as a GMO. So uh, that might be, um, a strategy to to avoid at this stage. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I was going to actually save this question, but this question um, I know uh, Jay and David we talked about before the the webinar, but I've seen it asked three times now. Um, so I think everyone wants to to be able to discuss it. But um, how would the uh, uh, the the global popcorn community react to to uh, the potential of using gene editing and popcorn is it even on the table or is it something that we are uh working on staying away for from for a while um and feel free to to both comment or or uh we can move on from there so uh i can't i can't comment on what any other breeding company might be doing um I can only say that uh, we've taken a position that as long as CRISPR is regulated as a GMO, um, we're not working with it. it, it it's, it's just problematic in Europe. Uh, that may change, but uh, 
Right now, no. Yeah, because the USDA is given a green light to it at, at this point, but it may that could change in the future. So you know, it's a lot. Of, it's a big investment to make with with still a lot of uncertainty going forward. Perfect. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm sure everyone will love to 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 continue to to think about that. Um, Let's see, Jay, I have another question that, that I think is a little bit more geared for, for your knowledge. Um, uh, this person wants to know if you could potentially discuss the shelf life of popcorn for different available germplasms. Um, I, of course, you can only speak to what uh, Ag alumni has, I, I, I assume. So um, do you have any, any um, information you can share about shelf life? So I, w I won't say there's there's no genetic component to shelf life. There there, there certainly is, and and you do have uh, you can have degradation of uh, color and expansion uh, in in storage. So if you start with uh, if you start with darker color and high expansion, you're going to have uh, a little more success. But by far and away, the biggest issues are around. Um, harvest uh, handling, um, not damaging the grain in, in, a, in a combine, and how you uh, condition the grain. In the popcorn world, we don't talk about drying grain, we talk about conditioning. Um, and it's done over uh, a relatively long period of time, over a month or so, without using heat or with using just very, very minimal heat to bring the corn down to the optimum popping moisture. And, and then at that point, if, uh, um, if you use grain chillers uh, to bring the temperature of the grain down and, and, and you keep it down, uh, you enhance shelf life. And that, that um, harvest, uh, being careful during harvest, uh, properly conditioning, and then properly storing the grain um, at least in our experience, have a have a far larger impact than the genetics. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, David, this next question is for you, and um, they wanted to know: Does QPM affect kernel starch content? The relative, um, it, the the in general, no. In general, the the protein and starch ratio stays the same. Okay, you're not changing. You're not changing the amount of protein, and and because of that, you're not really changing. But endosperm is basically starch and protein. So if you don't change the the amount of protein, you don't change the starch either. So the answer to that is no. It's starch, by and large, stays pretty stable. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have another uh, comment from you, David. This is a, a bit of a doozy. So if you need me to repeat it, let me know. It says, um, it looks like you successfully increased lysine and approximately it looks doubled. Um, yeah. How much is biologically relevant for human consumption? Is doubling enough to prevent lysine deficiency in a popcorn rich diet? Or would it have to be something like 10, 10 times more or 100 times more? Um, well, if you if you look at the, um, let me just go back to these these graphs that I showed. Um, so, if 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 we were eating raw raw popcorn kernels and we were and we were um, trying to derive our, our, the bulk of our protein from popcorn, which of course we're not going to do, then yes, doubling it would would um, doubled lysine uh, makes popcorn as what we would call a complete protein source. Um, as you can see, there is a slight reduction in, in the amount of available lysine. So um, this is to the point where it's, it, it's not doubled. Okay, so at this point, we can say it, it's an enhanced protein source, but, um, but it's not at this point. Well, it, it's still doubled if you compare the, the air popped kernels to um, to their respective popcorn parents so um, but again we're not we're not promoting this as uh, as a major protein source per se it's more of a of a marketing you know this is one one element of imp of improved um, nu nutritional quality and um, 
in a niche product. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, David. I think we have enough uh, time for two more questions. So, Jay, this question is directed, I think, more to you. Um, what is... Um, when you compare popcorn lines to normal corn lines, uh, what are some potential disease and pest resistance scenarios you might uh, see or experience? So pop popcorn is going to have all the same uh, uh, disease and, and pest issues that dead corn does. Um, that's exacerbated because we don't have BT, um, right? So we have to be uh, concerned about worm damage. Um, but the, the breeding objectives, uh, as far as disease resistance, are the same. So we're we're working on all the same all the same issues as dead corn. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jay. And then uh, David, I'll throw the last question to you. Um, does the QPP uh, retain fat or oil differently than than I guess your your regular popcorn? Retain fat or oil in terms of on the popped flake or in the kernel itself? Uh, that that is an excellent <laughs> question. Maybe let's talk about both scenarios. Well, let, okay, uh, let me speculate on both. Well, the first, it, if we were if we're talking about oil um, within the kernel itself, um, we we're, we're not seeing changes in the relative proportion of endosperm to embryo in these kernels, and since the since the oil is stored in the in the embryo of the grains, um, then we wouldn't expect to change the oil content. And that that um, potentially, if that were true, and we changed the embryo size, that would potentially be relevant to the question on on um, on shelf life in kernels because it's the oil within grains which co can cause rancidity. So we would be probably not pleased if we were substantially increasing the embryo size and oil content of these. And I'm not sure what effect oil would have on the popability of these kernels. I suspect it would be a negative effect. In terms of um, how does this affect oil retention on the flakes? Well, um, that, that would vary depending on the type of flake that we would we were talking about so you know <coughs> excuse me if uh if we're talking about butterfly flake then that potentially has a um a different um different amount of affinity to the to the to whatever um oil or butter uh, toppings you're putting on on that flake and the same with the same with with the uh, mushroom flake which is more uh more used for heavy coatings such as car caramel. So I'm not sure which of those um, angles the question was really intended, but hopefully that gives some answer to both. Perfect. Thank you so much, David. Well, I think that's all the time we had today. So I wanted to thank both of our speakers, Jay and David, one last time for joining us. And I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who participated. We loved hearing your questions and we hope you found some information of value uh, today. Um, again, a recording of this webinar is going to be made available in the next cu couple of days at uh, seedworld.com. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, we hope you all have a terrific day. This is Alex Martin of Seed World signing off. Thank you.